Listen to the word of God that comes to us in the third chapter of the Gospel of John. And when we get to the 16th verse, I want you to join in and share that with me. Jesus said, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I want to pause a moment um, it was four years ago this evening that the first time ever our church council met on a Zoom meeting. Some of us were here in Parish Hall and we're in that room and the council came together to make a decision to close the church and have worship virtually. On that night, we had no idea what that meant long term. We didn't know we were trying to be careful and thoughtful and protect you. Um, four years have gone by. The world has seen the death of millions and millions of people because of COVID-19. And all of us have been changed. Every single one of us has been changed. So I want to pause for a moment before beginning to just give thanks to God, but also to be at peace and thanksgiving for the gift of life and, for, and in memory for those who we have lost in our lives. Would you be in silence with me, please? On this fourth Sunday of Lent, the fifth sermon on uh, Jesus and the Jeffrey window as the inspiration. Today's window is not my will but thine, which is found in the center, in the center aisle, the third medallion in in the center. Jesus um, on his knees in prayer and the angel above him. Let us begin with a prayer as well. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our salvation. Amen. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, for God sent the Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Rejoice, people of God. God loves you. That's the message here. God gave his only son for you. God gave his son for the entire world. Not for the church, not first church, not for all the churches downtown, not for all the churches in Columbus, not for Columbus, not for Ohio, not for America, but for the world. God gave his son not to condemn the world that God had created and loved so entirely, but to save the world. Somewhere between the beginning of Lent and this day, somewhere between the beginning of each of our lives and this point, 
somewhere between the ecstasy of new life and the agony of death, we have forgotten or maybe lost track of what is absolutely the most amazing gift, and that is the love of God given to us in our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's good to be reminded of this today in case it wasn't my idea. <laughs> it was the Gospel of John's idea. It is, a, it is good to remember and rejoice in the truth that God is not in the business of condemning us or condemning the rest of the world while others may want to play God and may want to manipulate the words of God for judgment over grace. God is about the business of loving and saving the world. But what does God's loving and saving business look like? John 3, 14 and 15 tells us that life in God's love through Christ is uplifting and eternal, comparing it to the passage Sandy read so well from Numbers, which should have really thrown you off. It is one of those readings that I say, after we're finished, we say, really? Thanks be to God. There's a lot of death in that one, right? <laughs> so, but the whole point of lifting up that Moses does, that Christ does, lifting up, and the eternity that is connected to that. Moses' serpent in the wilderness, Jesus is being lifted up in the ascension on the cross. And in lifting up, belief in God's sacrifice and glory are given shape and form, and eternal life is offered. Uplifting and eternal are central elements of God's saving love. I have seen the uplifting and eternal nature of God's love so often become manifest in love through suffering and through pain that people share in difficult and tumultuous times. While I sometimes wish that I could wave a magic wand over the world and make agony and pain and suffering love just disappear, I'm also aware that so much is experienced in the immensity and the intensity of suffering love, which would be diminished and even unrecognizable without it. To suffer in love for the one whom you love in the midst of their suffering is to live life to its holiest. You have told me this. You have shown me this. You have embodied this, and you didn't learn it from somebody else. You learned it from Jesus. You learned it from those who had followed him and showed it to you first. In the Garden of Gethsemane, a scene depicted in the panel, the medallion in the Jeffrey window today, Jesus is crying out to God, let this cup pass from my lips. But even so, Father, Thy will, not mine, be done. Jesus is sweating blood, we read. He is anguished as he cries all alone before God. Remember, his disciples were supposed to be awake while he was praying and they'd all fallen asleep. He even woke them up and they fell asleep again. But he's all alone and he's crying to God to please let this pass. And what happens? Do you remember what happens? Silence. God doesn't speak to him this time. He's met with the silence of God, which is devastating because he knows there is only one path forward, and that is through the cross. There he is. We see him in his sweating blood, in his anguish cries. We see grace twisted by pain, but embraced by love. We see a peace which passes human understanding growing out of the depth and the agony of suffering. I often think of love coming from pain. So often in the paintings of Vincent van Gogh, which I love, you see the struggles of this man to show us beauty in the midst of his own pain. He could see such beauty and color in the world and he would show it to us, but you know that he was tortured inwardly and his pain was intense. He suffered emotionally and mentally his whole life, but he portrayed beauty out of it. One painting named The Disposition has always moved me deeply. The Disposition 
depicts the scene at the foot of the cross just following. The body of Jesus lies at the foot of the cross. John, the author of today's gospel, the beloved disciple, having been there with him at the cross, is washing his body of the blood. Jesus' mother Mary is looking on. She's close at hand. Her face is terribly twisted in pain. Her body turns halfway toward him and halfway away from him, meaning that she can barely look at her son, but she must look at him, and yet she, she can't stand what she's seeing. In the distance, you see several people, including the shadowy figure of Peter, hiding, hiding from all of this in their pain, in their denying, in their abandoning of Jesus in his crucifying death. For those who have stood by the cross and thus stood by him in his suffering, there is intense pain, and their pain is holy pain. For those who have denied him, perhaps tortured him or abandoned him, the pain is different. It is the pain of guilt. It is the pain of dispossession. Uplifting and eternal are elements of God's saving love, and such love is often experienced in the pain of dispossession. And honestly, it is what we do in the face of the cross and at the foot of the cross which matters the most. To experience God's uplifting and eternal love, we have to go to the cross. We have to abide at the cross. We have to take time at the foot of the cross or the foot of a bed of someone who's suffering or the side of the bed where they are suffering. And we have to witness the agony of the soul, the suffering of the other. We have to abide. We must come to the hard places and we have to be still in our lives who show us their suffering and show us how to love, how to praise God and how to be of service to others. Hilda Miller showed me how to love. Hilda was a member of my first church. Her only son, Jean, had been born at home in a home birth. So 88 years into her life, Hilda had never been in a hospital. When she went to the Cleveland Metro General Hospital in 1987, she never made it out. She never went home again. They kept finding things wrong with her. And she said to me once, why do they keep finding things wrong with me? Mostly, it was cancer that had spread everywhere. Nevertheless, and what do we know? We know God is always in the nevertheless. She kept praising God. She said to me one day, Tim, I don't understand why this is happening, but I do understand that God loves me, and that is enough for me. He has put me here to die, but as I die, I will share his love with every single person who comes through that doorway until the day that I am gone. In her agony, Hilda shared her improbable praise and brought me to my knees and to tears. Hilda Miller, like so many I have come to know at the foot of the cross or the side of a bed, reached a point in her battle for life in which all she could do was cry to God one last time, something like this. Lord, you've been in my life. You've guided my actions. You've guided me all the days of my life, and you've walked with me through everything. Now be with me in my dying. Lift me up and carry me in your arms into your heavenly dwelling place that you call home so that I may call it home too. I can no longer care for my family, Lord. I hate that anything bad would ever come to them. So I leave them in your hands, in the hands of those whom you send as angels of mercy and love. Help them accept your presence in their lives, however you choose to make your love manifest. Jesus said it his way. Father, let me live, please. But if it's your will that I die, may your will be done.
At the heart of today's gospel is God's undeniable love. Mother Teresa of Calcutta once wrote of John 3.16, the good news is that God still loves the world through you. You are God's good news. You must become better people because they've met you. We must radiate God's love. Listen to this verse, and just if you need to, close your eyes. I want you to hear it as it unhacks. God so loved the world. God so loved the world that he gave. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You see, it's all about love. God loves the unlovable and the unlovely. God loves the lonely who have no one else to love them. God loves the man who has no love for God whatsoever and God loves the woman who lives in God's presence continuously. God loves the graceless and the graceful. God loves the haters and the hated. God loves the one who has never given a thought to God and has no clue how to lift one prayer. And God loves the one who thinks about God all the time and prays unceasingly. God loves the one who's angry at God and God loves the one who's content in God. God loves the one who spits at God, and God loves the one who smiles at God. God loves you just the same as God loves me. As St. Augustine wrote, God loves each of us as if there was only one of us to love. As we head into the final days of Lent, having been filled with the joy of this Sunday and lots of pink, I hope we carry this joy with us to the end. And we've been blessed by Thompson, who while we stopped singing, kept singing to us, and once he got wet, he rethought it, but after he heard you singing again, he got back into it, right? Let's bear in mind there's a couple things that will always be. For example, your smartphone will always figure out on this day to turn the clock forward. And on that day in the fall, it will turn it backwards. I have yet to figure that one out, right? There will also be things that will be said to you that you don't understand. Words will be spoken that do not reflect love. There will be someone who spreads tales about you to others. There will be unkindnesses said. There will always be viruses, and there will be wars, and there will be rumors of war. But this is what we need to leave with. There will always be something else. And that something else is the unconditional love of God. So remember this even more. God's deep and broad love is uplifting and eternal and will always be there for you. And Jesus will also always be there for you in the agony of prayer, in the dark night of your soul. And always he rises from his suffering and he helps us to rise from ours, to know the joy of living, whether it's for one more minute or 50 more years. God's love is a rising love. Can anyone ever love us more than this?